So when we start considering short range effects of respiratory jets and plumes, it raises the interesting question of what is the role of social distancing, which is our primary means for fighting the pandemic uh, at the moment. So as we've discussed, uh, this is especially important when masks or face shields are not worn so that the jets and plumes that come from breathing and speaking and singing and other respiratory activities are not blocked in the sense that the momentum is not blocked. And furthermore, there's no filtering going on. So then we have our long range airborne risk coming from respiratory aerosols that have become well mixed into the background air. But we have a new term that comes from short range transmission. And in a worst case scenario, we can imagine that as a, a wedge like or cone like plume, uh, which we have just described, in reality, there's going to be some flows background in the background flows in the room, which will sweep that jet in different directions and break it up. There'll be motion of people, turning of heads. So it'll never be this simple. But the worst case scenario is really a, a well formed respiratory jet and somebody essentially standing right in it at a certain distance X bar, which is our sort of average social distance. As we've discussed, we can also take the ratio of these two terms and speak of FS, which we define here as the short range risk enhancement factor. So that comes down to two new parameters, which we've been discussing, PJET, the probability that uh, a susceptible person is in the respiratory jet of an infected person, and X bar, the typical distance uh, over which that occurs. XC is this transition distance where the respiratory uh, jet concentration starts to match the, that of the background ambient air, uh, which we substitute and form this expression uh, shown here. So uh, there are a number of situations we can think of uh, to estimate uh, what would be uh, how, how these parameters. So the first would be just to uh, consider random occupant, place, occupant placement. So in this situation, if we view from above, we have, uh, let's say, a person. This is now viewing from above. And they have a respiratory jet, which is going off like this uh, in one direction. And then at any given distance, we can, uh, we, we can imagine there's, a, there's sort of a typical uh, social distance here I'm uh, kind of exaggerating how far that is compared to the size of the head. Uh, but if this distance here is x bar, then at that distance, we'd like to say, what is the probability that uh, that susceptible person is, is, is in the jet? And that would simply be formed by taking the angle of the jet relative to uh, the full circle. So we can imagine, what is the probability of putting a person right here versus over here or over here where they're not going to be in the jet? So in that situation, we could write that the P jet is approximately uh, the inverse tangent of alpha. So alpha, remember, is the, uh, is the, uh, the ratio, um, is the entrainment factor. And it's sort of the, the, uh, um, the, the slope of this, of this uh, line defining the, uh, the, the cone um, of the respiratory jet. And then we could divide that by pi. So that basically tells us the probability of being in this yellow region versus somewhere else at a given distance. And then now, if we think about the distance factor, if it's completely random, then if we just imagine lots of people scattered throughout a room, imagine a, a busy space, for example, in a, in a bar or a nightclub, a place where it's somewhat crowded, but people are kind of moving around, uh, then we might have an average social distance, which is the area of the room divided by n, so that's the area per person, and then take a square root. That's a, an estimate of the distance. And the square root of area is the length L of the room, so it's divided by square root of n. And so with these two assumptions, uh, we would then find that this uh, short range risk and enhancement factor, well, what does it look like? It then is uh, this factor P jet uh, times Xc over L times, and then we have um, this n minus 1 factor. So if n is, reasonable, is larger than 1, we could just estimate, es estimate that as a square root of n. So what that shows is as more and more people pack into the room, we have an increase in the importance of short range versus long range uh, transmission. And this prefactor here is something 
uh, which typically will be much less than one because the probability of being in a jet, if alpha is uh, around 0 0.1, 0 0.15, this turns out to be around 3%. Okay, so that's, uh, it's not quite as wide as I've sketched here. The jet is a little bit more narrow. Um, and we've already discussed that Xc, the distance where the concentration in the jet starts to match that of the ambient, it does depend on the conditions of the room and the ventilation and other factors. But roughly speaking, Xc is, is typically smaller than the size of the room. And so this factor here is quite a bit less than one. So you see that in a random situation, the uh, short range transmission starts to become important only when the number of people becomes large and it grows like square root of n. And there's a certain point uh, which might be at n equals 20 or n equals 50 or n equals 100, depending on the space, where the short range risk is larger than the risk of the background airborne transmission. Um, and that's again, just coming from random placement. So on the other hand, the random placement situation is not quite the best case scenario, but it's sort of a fairly optimistic scenario. The best case scenario is that people are always kind of having their backs to each other, never breathing on each other. That never really happens. In fact, it's more typical in human interactions for people to face each other. They may be talking to each other, looking at each other. And so hence, we tend to find ourselves more typically in the way of, uh, of, of breathing. And so it might be better to think about this estimate in other ways. So a second way that we can think about it is by using a social distance guideline, or social distancing rule, let's just say. So let's say that um, instead of a random situation where people are kind of keeping you know, sort of the average distance between each other, that no matter how many people in the room, up to a certain maximum occupancy, they're not going to come within, let's say, a six foot radius or a three foot radius one meter radius, depending on what the social distancing guideline is in that region, there's going to be a certain sort of minimum x. And let's just think of that as the worst case scenario. For the people that are that close to each other, that's the distance we'll choose. And so this might be something like six feet, one meter, you can pick. And in that case, the uh, fs is uh, p jet over n minus one. Uh, times xc over x. And we've already estimated that at six feet, xc over x, it does depend on the uh, ventilation and the size of the room and other factors. Uh, but we've already said that uh, this factor here might be something like six to 600 for a certain set of examples that we've just considered. Uh, so when we put all this together, if we take into account also that PJ is around, let's say 3%, if we imagine having random uh, placement of people, but at a fixed distance, minimum distance of, uh, of six feet, then what we'll find is this ends up being something like 0.2 over n, ranging up to, uh, let's say, 20 over n. Uh, and again, this is just very rough. So this is with random uh, angle. So in other words, we're still thinking now of, of just this kind of random orientation of somebody's head, uh, not necessarily facing one person all the time. And so you can see here that uh, if n is, um, if, you know, if we're in the situation of, of the 20, which is, by the way, that's the case where this is getting large, so that would be um, a case of uh, a, large, a large room, or it would be of um, uh, low breathing rates, uh, for, et cetera, uh, then we, you can see that when n gets, uh, if n is uh, uh, small, uh, then, then, then this number can actually be quite large. So in other words, if we just have a few people in the room and they can get this close to each other, like one, one minimum social distance, like six feet, then the primary risk is coming from airborne transmission, especially if the room is very big. If two people are by themselves in an enormous room, then the risk from background airborne transmission is minimal compared to the risk of direct uh, short range transmission. So that kind of makes sense, right? On the other hand, notice the effect of n. If we have more and more people in the room, then even though most of those people are a lot farther away, there's so many of them that are potentially going to get infected that it becomes worse uh, to, to even in the case of 20 here, which is sort of the more, uh, you know, the case where short range is more important, it starts to switch to where the long range transmission becomes more important when n is larger than 20 in this particular example. So basically, uh, so significant for small n 
and basically large V. So basically, low occupant densities, if people are to come close to each other, then it makes sense shoreline is important. In fact, a limit that we haven't talked about yet is what if we're outside? What if we don't even have, what if the V goes to infinity, or V is very large, so effectively it's infinity, what this is telling us is that we have to stop worrying about the long-range background well-mixed concentration of infectious aerosols, and instead we have to focus on the short range. Just whenever people are coming close to each other, make sure they're not breathing directly on each other for long periods of time. That's the key. Now, the last we can think of, which is really kind of like a worst-case scenario, that would be where a person is at the closest distance that's allowed or expected, let's say six feet, maybe even three feet, one meter. And also, they're not randomly placed in angle, but they're really just constantly in the jet of the other person. So let's say, for example, P jet uh, is 90%. That's a pretty high number, keeping in mind that there's also turbulent and chaotic flows in the room, such that even if, if you're facing somebody all the time, the stable uh, respiratory jet and puff train is going to be swept away by other currents. And so it's really not as though the other person is constantly going to be in uh, fully exposed. But let's just say we pick a number like 90%, which is kind of like a worst case scenario. And we're always facing each other. So let's, you know, let's again pick, you know, sort of X bar is, let's just say six feet. Let's just say, or you, maybe we're sitting across uh, a table at a distance, you know, which is sort of an acceptable social distance according to the six foot rule. Uh, then we're going to find that this enhancement factor is around 6 over n to 600 over n. Uh, so we can see that um, the uh, short range effect can be a lot larger. Um, so, if, so notice, even if n gets to be really large, like a lot of people in the room, let's say it's a restaurant with 100 people in the room, uh, still, it's six times worse to be in a single person's respiratory jet 90% of the time at six foot distance. So that's actually fairly alarming. If you think about uh, situations such as restaurants or office meetings or any other normal activity where people are facing each other and breathing on each other continuously uh, without wearing masks or face shields. So this would be uh, just mentioned here, short range dominates in this situation. So then, how do we mitigate against this short range transmission risk, which is gonna be worse again when we have people that are not wearing masks or face shields and are in close proximity and facing each other for long periods of time. And especially in a larger room where in a lower occupant density where the, the, the N is maybe not so big and we don't have to worry as much about long range transmission. Well. One way to proceed is to continue using the universal guideline that we've derived right here for long range and simply choose a small epsilon much less than one. And you can see here, it doesn't have to be that tiny. From this, this simple estimate here, uh, you know, maybe an epsilon of 0 0.01, you know, might not be so bad because see this number 600 is there and if N is, you know, maybe five or 10 in the room, then that might be already helping you. So remember, we use the guideline with a fudge factor or a tolerance epsilon and some of the uncertainties in different modes of transmission are already kind of included in there. Uh, but certainly if we're not wearing masks, the risk is pretty high, and so that may not be enough. And that's why uh, social distancing can help. But I want to emphasize from our discussion of these, these respiratory plumes, there's nothing really that special about six feet. There's unfortunately today a feeling in the general public that if you're closer than six feet, you're at extremely high risk. You've penetrated somebody's bubble. But when you're a little bit more than six feet, you can breathe easy because you're safe. And you can see that's really not true. If you are not wearing masks, these respiratory jets and plumes can travel very long distances. Of course, airborne transmission is everywhere in the room at any distance. But even the elevated risk of short range transmission can extend further than six feet. On the other hand, when people are turning their heads and there's uh, sort of convection in the room and thermal convection as we've been discussing, in fact, six feet might be overkill. Maybe being even a little bit closer might be okay. But the important thing is that, that distance is not so special. And also, the details matter. So as you can see here, we can get very different estimates based on where the occupants are placed, how they're facing each other, what kind of activities they're engaging in, what kind of movements. So there's really no universal guideline. It makes more sense to start from a universal guideline for long range transmission and then enforce mask use in situations 
where we are worried about transmission. Uh, rather than trying to guess how people are going to behave and what kind of distance they're going to keep, uh, not wearing masks. So the safest thing is, if you're worried about coronavirus transmission, just wear a mask, indoors especially. So that brings us now to thinking about summarizing this entire chapter going beyond the well-mixed room, where we've been discussing the fluid mechanics of indoor spaces and of, of uh, human occupants uh, and respiration within those spaces. So I think I'd like to leave you with a picture of people who are smoking in the room. So uh, we're all familiar with this situation where you have a room, let's say, uh, could be a restaurant or uh, some other space where there uh, is, let's say, a table or a few tables where there's maybe five or ten people in the room, and there's one person or two people that are smoking. Now, we know that when the person who's smoking breathes in on the cigarette and exhales, there's a very dense plume of smoke that comes out. It, uh, is, it's carried by thermal currents and rises. And you know that if you stand right in that space, it will be a very significant amount of smoke you're going to have to breathe. In fact, it's courteous for the person who's smoking to breathe away and not breathe directly into other people's faces. That would be sort of rude. And maybe as we're thinking about respiratory transmission, of viral disease, we should think in the same way. Each person should be worried about, am I really breathing directly on another person? If I'm not wearing a mask, why don't I breathe somewhere else? But we also know from our experience with uh, smoke-filled rooms that there may only be one or two people smoking, and you can occasionally see these puffs or bursts of smoke uh, when they're exhaling after drawing on a cigarette. But if you look around, the rest of the time, the smoke is kind of swirling around. It's a little more concentrated in some places, but you can see very quickly it's uniformly spread throughout the room. And somebody who's on the far side of the room is at essentially the same risk as somebody who's very close, even six feet or three feet away, whatever that special distance may be, because the air is typically well mixed. And those smoke particles end up throughout the room, and you're just as much risk at 60 feet as you are at six feet under those circumstances. And so that's really kind of the main message um, of, uh, of, of this course, uh, while we also keep in mind that there are these sort of details of short-range transmission that I'd like you to be aware of when applying uh, the guideline for long-range aerosol transmission.